starting. Thank you. So welcome again, everybody. I'm Marty Solomon, and along with Emily Mankey I, and Mike P Peroni from NABC, we host these Lunch and Learns once or twice a month. And we're so glad that you're here today for this one with Mike Poteet from Pierce County Department of Planning and Public Works. We're going to hear all about meat production and processing and a study that he's recently completed. So very excited about that. If you have questions along the way, just please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll open it up for questions. There'll be plenty of time for that after Mike shares information with us. Um, so go ahead and feel free to use the chat anytime. And um, let's get started, Mike, with- Sure. Yeah, th thank you, Marty. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Mike, and the rest of the folks from uh, the partnership that I've worked with over the last few years. And to those of you I don't know, uh, nice to have you here. Um, so my name is Mike Poteet. I'm a senior planner with the Long Range Planning Division within uh, Pierce County's Department of Planning and Public Works. Uh, within Pierce County, we have a two-person team that focuses on agricultural issues for the county. Uh, and so I'm here today to present some results of what was supposed to be um, a pretty quick project, but for various reasons got prolonged. Uh, we did read, we were, tasked with um, conducting a regional evaluation of the meat production and processing industry. And it ended up becoming a collaborative project between Pierce and Thurston counties. Uh, due to this collaboration, we were able to bring on an outside consultant. So we worked with uh, the firm Mall Foster and Alonji, which I'll refer to as MFA through the course of today's conversations. Um, to help us with collecting data and analyzing it and, and actually authoring the majority of the report. They're based out of Vancouver, Washington, uh, with offices up and down uh, Washington and Oregon. So they are a, a local consulting firm. And where did this all start? Like, why, why did this matter? <laughs> well, um, in Pierce County, we had an agriculture advisory committee to our Pierce County Council. Um, that is now a commission just as of a few months ago. But at the time uh, that this topic came up, we had a, an advisory committee to council um, and some of the livestock producers on that committee were bringing up uh, or bringing to everybody's attention some of the things that we were seeing on a national scale during uh, the, the worst of the COVID pandemic uh, about uh, interruptions to supply chains and inability for livestock producers to get access to slaughter and processing services. So that was all going on uh, during COVID. And in October of 2021, Pierce County passed our biennium budget for 22-23. Within that, they, they threw in a little budget proviso, which for those of you that don't work in government, basically is an add-on to all the um, budget allocations that elected officials might take or might make because they want some sort of special project to get um, some support. And so I didn't request this money. Uh, this came, <laughs> this was put into our county budget by our elected officials. They put in a small amount of money to do this, what they, they described in their proviso as an evaluation of regional agricultural meat production and processing infrastructure and labor capacity needs. So what does that mean? Well, when I see regional, I don't think Pierce County. I think all the uh, neighboring areas that farms are competing with our farms to get a limited amount of services. You know, there's definitely uh, issues with scarcity associated here, and that's really what we're trying to capture. So, um, thinking on a regional scale, we we started kind of proofing things out within Pierce County, and very quickly um, we were. Uh, able to reach an agreement with Thurston County to match the funds that we had allocated in our budget. So then we were able to go out and get uh, the services of MFA under contract and really expand the scope of this thing. So that's what you see here on this slide is uh, we went from kind of sitting around on our thumbs for a little bit of time to, to branching outward pretty aggressively. And we were able to... Um, 
<laughs> well, we, we worked with county staff. We worked with conservation district staff. We reached out to Farm Bureau chapters, uh, WSDA, anybody that had anything to do with um, with expanded networks of, of potential collaborators that would be affected uh, by um, limited access to processing services, we tried to reach. And so we we had Pierce County pretty well covered. And so we then needed to bring in Thurston County. Those are our two sponsoring counties as shown on the map. And then through those networks, we began getting participation from farms in the counties that are uh, dark blue on this map. And we were also collecting information just more broadly uh, from counties that are shaded with a light blue. We were also able to gather some information, not necessarily from producers, but uh, some background on processing or, or what have you, or previous studies that had been conducted by other entities. Um, but what we what we really wanted to do was to make sure that um, we were really focused on what's happening here locally slash regionally and not get too bogged down in what's going on with all the federal or with all the national interruptions uh, to the meat uh, to the meat supply chain. So we kept hearing lots of things about labor shortages, um, you know, uh, storage and uh, la labor was really a big one. Everybody wanted to talk about labor. So we made sure that was a big piece of this as instructed. And um, what we came up with was a, a dual approach here. So we decided we really needed to do outreach to both the demand side of this and the supply side. So the next slide, please. So what we have is, um, you know, most of you probably know this if you're interested in meat processing at all, but um, we really have two pathways for slaughter and processing. Um, we have the USDA and the WSDA. And, and what we're talking about here is inspections. So if a facility has a, a USDA inspection process going on, then those meats can be sale, sold through retail outlets, grocery stores, butcher shops, restaurants, um, you know, they are the highest level of inspection that's available to meat producers and generally leads to a premium price for our farmers. Um, now, it's more costly to go through that processing route. So, um, you know, there is a balancing that our farms have to do when it comes to uh, returns. But because of the limited availability of USDA license and inspected facilities, uh, in the South Puget Sound region, a lot of our farms are reliant on this WSDA pathway. And what that is, is that requires producers to sell an entire animal uh, through the custom meat exemption process, which um, can be quite onerous for farms. Uh, you know, it can be difficult to sell a whole cow to one buyer. So oftentimes that animal may be bought between four or as many as eight people. Um, uh, it's, it's not quite as complicated for, for pork or lamb or goat, but, um, even so a farm must sell the entire animal before it can be slaughtered and processed. Uh, so that does create additional challenges for the farms. Um, and, you know, for that WSDA pathway, that is only for household use. That's not going to be something you're going to get at a store or the, the, at a restaurant. Um, so through the course of today's conversation, when we say USDA, we're talking about that federal inspection process, you know, retail meats. And when we say WSDA, we're referring to um, that sort of, uh, whole, you know, internal home, uh, you know, individual purchaser use only. I do want to call out here, and this is, this is discussed in the report, but there's a third approach which uses a USDA slaughter and the retail meat exemption uh, with local health department approvals uh you know and and so there it it's not widely used but it is out there but just for to avoid confusion about that sort of kind of hybrid situation when we say wsda today we mean this one and we say usda we mean um, there's a retail so i just wanted to point that out and in the study itself there is a discussion about the retail meat exemption okay next slide uh quick quick disclaimer here 
kind of walking you through the process of the study so that you understand how we got to where we got, um, then we can go back with questions and, and sort of pick things apart and understand the findings. But I think it's important to understand how we get to a study that um, sort of changed its its shape a few times. Uh, so we started in Pierce County, as I sort of mentioned earlier, to kind of test out what we were doing and the questions we wanted to ask and what the variables of importance were. So we worked with local farms that we knew and partners uh, within Pierce County to kind of refine that process. And then once we were able to partner with Thurston and bring in the outside consultant, we had a, a kind of a baseline to work from. And then we we did broader, broader outreach um, and, and partnering efforts with uh, with with similar partners in Thurston County. So we had a kickoff meeting in January of this year with all of these county partners. I think we had 14 folks in attendance from, uh, let's see, we went Snohomish, King, Pierce, Thurston, Lewis, Mason, Grace Harbor, Kitsap. Um, those were the primary groups in the, or, or geographies engaged. And then we use those connections to, to begin the engagement process with producers and with processing and slaughtering facilities um, through the spring and con, uh, simultaneously pulling together some industry and policy research stuff. Uh, we began a GIS analysis and pulled our findings and recommendations together at the, in late spring uh, and presented the findings to both Pierce and Thurston County elected leaders in uh, mid-July. So next slide. How we did it was, uh, as I mentioned, we had 14 regional partners to help us with this kickoff. Uh, we ended up completing surveys of over 100 producers across this region. Um, we got uh, almost 15 slaughter slash processing entities to provide us information. And we conducted a couple of focus groups with farms uh, where we got pretty decent turnout, farms that were willing to participate in this engagement process. We had um, some some evening uh, forums where we, we tracked everything with these Miro boards and we did uh, in session polling and kind of real time um, did some validation of what we got in survey responses. So we, we had conducted the surveys before we did these focus groups and it allowed us to kind of ground truth what we thought we were hearing from farms in the process of the surveys. Um, and it, I'll, I'll just point out here from the uh, slaughter and processing side of things, surveys were a little harder for them. And, it, and we were warned about that by WSDA staff that had been working with them for a couple of years. And we were told plainly, just, just call them, just talk to them. So we sort of did a, a hybridized survey slash focus group with the uh, with the, the slaughter and processing side. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that in just a, a, another minute. So next slide. The engagement process um, was was pretty powerful for the producers. Like I said, we had really good engagement, over 100 responses to the survey and good participation in these focus groups. They identified lots of barriers and we kind of put it back to farms to tell us things that could be helpful. And then we kind of had to pull those concepts together into some broad recommendations. And we'll talk about the recommendations a little bit later, but um, obviously, Limited availability of services, especially USDA, was something we heard about. Costs continue to increase. Uh, land and equipment availability. Uh, sometimes the equipment issues were uh, related to uh, just being able to more effectively manage herds and herd sizes. And sometimes it had to do with getting animals to uh, slaughtering facilities and locations. Uh, we also came across a pretty notable experience and education gap between our farms. Um, you know, the, the, the newer farms that are out there, which we're trying to encourage to, to stick with it and, and, and really make a go at this for just in general, the health of the local food system, um, you know, they were really, really big on more, more, more when it comes to facilities and access. Some of our older and more established livestock producers were much more cautious in that approach and, and really wanted to focus on the concept of right sizing the responses to these issues um, because of the fact that, you know, over overbuilding and overcapacity is actually going to lead to collapse of more services because it's going to stretch things really thin. So 
um, they were really focused on us talking about an equilibrium and, and not, you know, skewing too far in one direction, getting the pendulum too far out of bounds and throwing the system out of balance. Um, so I thought that was a, a really interesting comparison between, um, you know, earlier career farms and those that have been around even as legacy multi-generational farms. So things that, that farms felt could help them would be, you know, new facilities, uh, new USDA facilities, upgrades, uh, more accessibility to, to trained labor, um, ways to, to better organize and coordinate uh, getting animals in and out of the slaughtering and processing facilities and more education and outreach opportunities for these earlier farms. And then um, just easier access to the mobile slaughtering, which is almost strictly WSDA services. Um, at least at this time, historically, there were USDA mobile slaughter services available, but that's been um, basically centralized down in Thurston County at this point. Um, so really excellent engagement from that. And we took that information and then we started to really try to tie that to what we heard from the slaughtering and processing side. So next slide. Um, again, none of this stuff should be uh, too groundbreaking, but from the slaughterers, we hear pretty much the same things. You know, waste management is an issue. You know, we're, especially for the mobile slaughtering units, they're going to two farms a day and they're driving you know, hundreds of miles. And, um, you know, after a day's work, they've got these these barrels of of offal that they need to offload, and you know different landfills aren't taking them, or the rates have gone up dramatically, or it's unpredictable who's going to take what when. And so, waste is a real issue, and it does contribute to these fuel and travel time and capacity issues. Um, one of our slaughtering partners in this project said, "Well, we have two trucks, but we only use one, and the second one is essentially our backup for either." spare parts or if um, the other truck is just down for more than what spare parts can fix. So um, this idea that uh, there's not very much resiliency built into these systems was uh, something that they really called out. And um, they, they didn't really have a lot of solutions at the time whenever we started posing questions. But when we went back to sort of start ground truthing some of our recommendations, um, they they were really on board with some of these concepts. So uh, we'll get to that in a little bit, but uh, they're, the main thing that, that slaughterers really want to do is just you know save time. They really need to be more efficient was their main thing. Um, and, and that can have a lot to do with equipment and replacements and things like that, but it also has to do with just traveling. And so we really had that stick in our heads as we as we started trying to pull together uh, what might be workable solutions. So next slide, look at the processing side of it. Sometimes a slaughter and a processor are the same. Sometimes they're not. Most commonly with the WSDA, they are two separate entities. Um, and so what we're seeing or what we're hearing from those folks is storage, you know, storage, storage, storage. Like we need more cold storage um, and we need better scheduling to keep our cold storage flowing. Um, you know, we, we have these WSDA customers, they've bought half a cow and they get it slaughtered, you know, and we're, we've been chosen as the processing facility and one customer picks up their half a cow, but another customer leaves their, their cow there for, you know, two weeks. And so their cooler is backing up. So that, that gets into, it's not just a space thing. It's also a scheduling thing and, and logistics of moving these products to the final end user. Waste management, also some of a challenge, but not nearly as much as those for slaughtering. Labor challenges, this was this is where the labor thing started to, to kind of become a little bit more clear for us. Um, the seasonality used to be really an issue here. So everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, many, many, many of our farms really want to harvest between September and November. It makes sense. That's whenever uh they they've they've uh, they've reached their their most efficient weight you know they, they've been through the most efficient gaining periods and anything beyond that is just kind of a a a, a lost cost for for a, a livestock farmer so they really want to hit that window now some of our farms have figured out these year-round uh, harvesting approaches but 
for a lot of our farms, like they really need to hit that window. So that's a real labor challenge for our facility. So how do you begin to balance that seasonal demand with maintaining a labor pool? Very difficult thing to do. Cost of labor is obviously an issue, but um, that that labor thing, it, it's not just about the seasonality there. It also ties into the space because several of the processors we talked to said, well, yeah, it'd be great to have an extra set of hands or two at our busiest times of the year, but it doesn't really matter because we don't have the space to hold what those extra sets of hands could generate for us. So the space is also tied to labor, um, or maybe I should say that the opposite. The labor is tied to the available space. And so it's really important to realize that this demand for more labor is not just a single need it's tied to other needs um so they they you know the processors love the ideas of grants and loans to help expand primarily space um which would then lead to greater capacity so you see some different needs on behalf of the slaughtering and the processing uh and this stuff was the, the processing stuff kind of across both wsda and usda uh, when it comes to the the space and the labor issues Okay, next slide. So I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail on this. This was something that we we did for the sake of the study, but um, the, the team at MFA did kind of a dive into what sort of policies and federal and state grant programs are out there and how can uh, our businesses access these things. A couple of important things that we call out in the study, um, you know, um, excuse me, sorry. Uh, we, you know, the state of Washington is not one of the states that has what's called a state inspection program. That's where the state basically has a USDA inspection equivalent program. Uh, Oregon adopted one in 2022. They're the most recent to do so. There's 29 of them around the country. Um, this was proposed in Senate Bill 5045 in 2021 legislative session. It didn't make it out of committee. Uh, there were some real concerns about the cost. Uh, to duplicate the services of USDA um, to get it off the ground. So it's something that has been thought about, but it's viewed as too cost prohibitive at the state level. Um, I did have a conversation with some staff of uh, federal uh, U.S. representatives and, and senators uh, and alerted them to the fact that, you know, if you want to increase capacity for farms to get access to inspected uh, meat processing, which would then increase uh, market access, uh, you know, the federal government could help offset some of those startup costs for these kinds of inspection programs. They kind of looked at me and thought, hmm, interesting, we'll never be able to get that done. <laughs> but uh, it, it just seemed very, uh, very limiting for, for the state of Washington. Uh, there's a secondary piece of that called the Cooperative Interstate Shipment Programs. There are six or seven of those in the country. And those allow you to not only have your state inspection program, but also then ship that at state inspected meat across state lines. Um, so that, that really is just as good as a USDA system, uh, USDA inspected uh, approach. So there are currently grants out there right now. Um, just recently, USDA put one out for meat and poultry, meat and poultry processing expansion program. Um, open to USDA facilities or those um, using a state-based equivalent program. Um, also open to governments and tribes to apply for these dollars. Uh, the round closes in November, if I recall, and uh, this one requires a 70% match. So you have to be pretty well healed to go after this grant, but it is out there. Um, and we have been uh, trying to get that out to some of our local uh local farms and processors that have expressed interest in expanding USDA. So that's out there. There's more of that in the report. Sorry, I have a gnat flying around my face um, in the report. So if you have more questions about that, we can direct you to other resources. Um, so the main thing out of the findings uh, for the industry and policy review that we wanted to highlight for our um, our sponsors of the, of the study, which are our local governments, was what can government do? Um, so we highlighted two different ones. Uh, one is Marzoff Meats up in Snohomish County, which is uh, has been WSDA for quite some time. Well, Snohomish King, actually, I should correct that. They're 
the the kind of based in King, but they they bleed over in Snohomish County. So that's a, a bit of a misstatement here. So apologize for that. Marzoff has been trying to go this route for quite some time, and they've had a lot of support from King County's uh, beefing up infrastructure program. Uh, over the course of about a decade, they've received over $650,000 in local and state grants and through programs sponsored by King County and the King Conservation District. Um, so they've really gone from you know, a, a startup to a, a, a real uh, important, small scale, but still important facility in kind of the, the central and north Puget Sound area. Um, most of our Pierce County farms are not you know, sending animals up to Marzoff. They're, they're a little bit more focused on the southern reach. But as Marzoff um, fulfills this transition into a USDA inspected facility, that will take some of the pressure off of the current facility we have in Thurston County. So even though this isn't a, a hugely important facility for our um, current Pierce County farms and Thurston County farms, uh, it will be beneficial to those north of us um, who don't have to rely on IGFC or going over to Pure Country in Moses Lake or try to get down to Thurston County. So um, an another facility is really important. And so just highlighting the fact that this is there and a lot of their success and being able to expand is due to grant and, you know, uh, public funding support to get them to this stage. Um, so they are set to open under USD inspection. I got this from, uh, Patrice in King County, uh, this fall, and they're going to have a pretty significant attempt to do some grand opening and, and do a, a media rollout so that folks are aware of the success story. Um, but you know, they got their last round of funding in 2022 from USDA and they're still putting everything in place. So just because you get a grant doesn't mean you're ready to to, you know, open the doors or cut the ribbon in, in a short amount of time. It can take years. Um, next slide is a is a state supported um, property and uh, or business. And I, I'm not going to divulge who it is because I wasn't given permission to do so. Although with a little bit of sleuthing, you can figure out who this is. Um, but in the region, uh, they were a pretty small facility, and over the course of 2022. They received two different $75,000 grants from WSDA, one through the local meat processing capacity grant and one through the local food system infrastructure grant. And they've doubled their cutting floor space. They've got a much larger holding area so they can keep animals from multiple farms uh, that are scheduled for slaughter instead of just having to go one or two farms at a time. Um, they've doubled their cold storage space and they're going to be able to expand the year round services, which again makes it a little bit more possible for those farms that are stuck in that really peak season to maybe to branch out a little bit. Um, they're considering going the USDA route at some point, but they really had to build capacity before they could do those things. Um, one really interesting thing about this is they were already set up to have uh, the mobile, so this is a WSDA facility, not a USDA facility. They were set up to have these mobile slaughtering units come in and, and slaughter a number of animals for them uh, any given day. Well, now that they're able to take more animals from multiple farms and keep them on site, that slaughtering unit can go up and take care of animals from two or three or four farms in any given day at one location. So that was a really big eye opener for us as we talked to this facility and we talked to that slaughtering operation of, hey, th this starts to show us a model of collaboration and cooperation that uh, should be repeatable uh, around the region. So we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit more in just a few minutes, but I wanted to call that out specifically at this location. Uh, okay, so next slide. We did some GIS work here. And what we were trying to do is we were just trying to capture what's really going on and who's participating and, and what are we really evaluating. Um, so. You know, the, the the map on the left is just showing, you know, where we actually got engagement from farms. And, you know, it wasn't as much as we would have liked. But anytime you can get, you know, 100 farms to respond to a survey, you feel pretty good about things. And you realize that, you know, we're not going to get a great feel for the total demand on this entire industry. But we are going to get a real feel for perspective. Uh, what are the true constraints in different parts of the region? 
Um, what does this look like? Uh, you know, what are their needs really? And so that's where we started. And, you know, the, the map on the right shows all these different types of processing facilities. And so when we, when we kind of opened the umbrella at 30,000 feet to say, let's try to capture as much as we can, it became pretty clear that like, we're never going to get the hard data that's going to help us crunch the numbers of what the true capacity is and, and where the bottlenecks are um, from a numbers game. So we started to back off a little bit of trying to quantify the total demand and the total supply of, of slaughtering and processing services because it just wasn't going to be a feasible approach here. So we took a slightly different tack and um, we, we wanted to use this GIS data for something valuable to help us tell this story of efficiency. So on the next slide, you'll see that we, we did something called a drive shed analysis. And to, to put it plainly, it's how long does it, uh, what's 100 miles, <laughs> basically, using the, the road networks. And what you see here is, um, it's, a, it's a little busy, acknowledge, I'll acknowledge that, but the yellow and red dots are producers. Um, the, the yellow circle is, well, let me, let me take a step back. The red stars, you'll see three of them on there, are USDA facilities. There's one down in Sandy, Oregon. There's one up at I, um, IGFC, Island Grown Farmers Cooperative. Uh, and then there's one at Southern Thurston County that's Puget Sound Processing and Heritage Meats. And then there's this other blue polygon on the right side there, and that's actually for Pure Country Harvest over in Moses Lake. So we wanted to show what's going on with the four primarily accessible USDA facilities uh, not not counting Mars off in this, we we didn't want to skew things uh, because it's it hasn't historically been available. And what we see is um, in this you know Thurston and Pierce region, along with Lewis and Mason and Grace Harbor, and yeah, you know, even up onto the peninsula, we have one, and that's Puget Sound Processing and Heritage Meats. And you know in the King County region and down in Pallets County and and further south, uh, you have overlap. You have you know, access to two of these facilities. So just realizing, you know, through a simple display like this, it, it kind of paints the picture of we do have a need in the region that was sponsoring this study. Um, you know, many of our farms are really reluctant to, to spend much time on the freeways with their livestock because of various issues. Uh, and so they like to remain on some of the back highways and smaller roads. Um, but this is just a good illustration of of a gap. And so that's that's what we wanted to start out with this drive shed analysis. And then we went a little further with it. If you go to the next slide, you'll see, um, OK, well, what does this look like for 50 miles? You know, when we did the survey, we asked our farms, like, how far is too far? And most of them don't really want to go more than 50 miles to get to a slaughter processing facility. So obviously the concentration of the number of farms uh, in a in an area is going to be focused on Pierce and Thurston because that's the the focus of the study, but it helps give us an idea of um, you know just how many producers are here. With the understanding we didn't get feedback from every producer, but you see you know just in this core of Thurston and Pierce County, you get over seventy producers within fifty miles very easily. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. We'll zoom in a little bit here. And one of the things we were asked to do was to pick out three locations in each county that uh, may be viable to, to host some sort of facility. And again, when we say facility, we're talking really loosely here. So I don't want you to think we're going to like go build new facilities everywhere. A facility could be lots of things. Um, and we looked at uh, transportation networks. We looked at proximity to um, existing kind of farm and agricultural support uh we you know there's a little bit of there's some missing data here unfortunately uh we weren't able to get any king county farms to participate in the survey uh so you know anything in mid pierce county and north pierce county is going to be skewed by that um the the lewis county demand is much greater than what we're able to survey and we know that uh so the central and southern thurston county sites probably have much more potential demand than what we've got just from our survey work. Um, and then the other piece of this is the, the coastal and peninsula demand is, is tremendous. They have no services except for the Thurston County site. 
um so that's those are all things that are not really captured in it excuse me one moment i'm sorry sorry about that um okay so let's let's get into the real meat of this thing so on the next slide we'll get into some of the recommendations that came out of this thing so we've been through all the findings we've talked about all these things and then what what do we actually want to tell the people that have sponsored these project this project so look having new usda and wsda facilities is going to be a benefit as long as it's done in balance you know we don't need to have uh, a large number of these new facilities coming online um the addition of some mobile slaughtering units would be beneficial uh especially for our farms that uh don't have the equipment that they need to haul livestock so i'm just going to do a little digression here lewis county the farms don't consider livestock hauling to be an issue at all. They've got the uh, the auction facility down there. Lots of folks have livestock trailers, not a big deal. In Pierce County, we have farms that don't all have their own livestock trailers. So they have to have um, the mobile slaughtering units come to them. And so if we were to look at additional facilities, what are ways to help get these animals to the facilities? So that's when we start talking about equipment needs. Um, what are some opportunities to to increase access to equipment like that? You know, are there tool libraries? You know, our conservation districts uh, frequently have things like that. Uh, could uh, livestock hauling equipment be part of those sorts of uh, uh, programs that are already in existence? Um, state policy could be revisited. You know, reevaluate the idea of an inspection program or an interstate sales program just for the sake of is it truly too expensive or is it something that really does benefit farms? Um, more investment in infrastructure, uh, state grants and federal grants. And it's not just a matter of those grants. It's a matter of helping our producers and our processors get those grants. One of the things I've been talking about recently is, you know, <laughs> From a funding perspective in Pierce County for agriculture, I don't need any more money, but what needs money is things that are helping folks write grants. Uh, you know, we, we really have a dearth of that, uh, that type of support available to our farms. And, you know, we have groups like NABC and others that can do that to a degree, but um, there's a lot of demand for access to those grant programs that we just can't meet right now. So when we say increasing infrastructure through grants, it's kind of a it's kind of looking at it from both ways. Like the grants need to be available, but we also ha need to have better ability to access those grants uh, for our local producers that are trying to compete with, you know, either larger or better organized um, groups of, of businesses in eastern Washington or at, at the federal level. A uh, slaughter and processing scheduling portal that gets back to that um, that issue of efficiency and getting meats in and out of facilities quickly, uh, so they're not getting backed up. Same thing with the central service hubs that gets into facilities. Uh, something that we talked about as part of this project was, um, you know, like satellite or or service hub facilities where there's just enough infrastructure in place for three or four farms to bring their animals on a given day and the mobile slaughtering unit can come in and slaughter multiple farms uh, animals at one time and one day instead of traveling 200 miles between two farms they can travel 80 miles and get four farms uh, and still get all those animals off to a processing facility uh, that's not the only type of service hub but it was one of the the primary concepts that our WSCA slaughterers uh, thought were uh, quite uh, quite attractive option a mentorship program, something to better connect our earlier career farmers with our more experienced farms, helping them understand ways to expand kind of their harvest windows a little bit, uh, looking at feeding efficiencies, uh, things to just help them understand how do you work with a slaughterer and a processing you know, partner? How do you build out a schedule? How do you really you know, put together a successful farm plan. Uh, there's there's not a lot of those services that farms are comfortable approaching. So something that's more farm to farm could be valuable. Um, the apprenticeship program for the meat cutting uh, certainly has value. They do exist. Um, the Northwest Meat Processing Association 
has something like that already in place. Um, uh, it's just a matter of finding partners at technical and educational facilities and things like that. So still a need for that, but it has to be balanced with infrastructure. Again, it goes back to space and labor and that balance. Um, more custom meat marketing approaches. Uh, there's some things that could be done out there to incentivize more people to go that route and buy those um, those bulk meat products. But a lot of people don't have the capacity to do that, whether it's through a freezer, uh, accessibility, or they live in a, you know, a highly urbanized environment and they don't know how to get access to these products. Uh, so some kind of marketing program uh, could be really beneficial there. Uh, we can talk about that more in detail. We had some ideas there. And this is kind of a random thing that we included, but it is relevant. The buffalo and beefalo, people say, well, why'd you put that in there? Those are two types of meat that can be sold retail, uh, even with just uh, a WSDA approved facility. So they don't have to be USDA inspected uh, to go retail with those two meat types. So it's just kind of a weird little oddity in our in our state and, and federal codes for food safety. So um, that one's in there just as kind of a, an, a throw in. Uh, so next slide, this is wrapping up here. We'll have us some time for questions. Um, just so you'd kind of know where we're going with this thing. Um, in July, we provided uh, feedback to the sponsors. Uh, in August, we distributed this widely to project participants, governments, industry partners, whoever wanted a copy of it. So it's out there, it's on our website. And then this fall, uh, we've got some briefings going to both the Thurston and Pierce County Ag Advisory Committee and Commission, respectively. Um, and we're trying to, we've shared information with some of our uh, uh, offices of our representatives from uh, D.C. and also within some state and uh, local legislators. And then things like this, doing outreach to food system partners and, and others that uh, may have an interest. So... That's where we are with this project. Uh, we don't have any additional funding to do any more work at this time. So it's kind of at a stasis. And my job from here on out is to basically answer questions from folks in the region and the industry that uh, wanna know more about this and what could be done next and uh, try not to get myself in any trouble in the process. So uh, with that, the next slide, uh, I'm all done and happy to just have a conversation and try to answer questions if you have them. Thanks, Mike. Such excellent information. If you have a question, you could just speak up. You could raise your little hand icon or you could just type it in the chat. Three options there. I guess um, I I was curious about mobile, the mobile um, slaughter and pro the mobile slaughter units. And the idea of stationary, like you had in an early slide talked about mobile slaughter at stationary locations and um, and then talked a little bit more about that kind of central service hubs to serve multiple farms. How does cold storage work with that? Like at, you've got, I see two things that you, um, two issues you talked about. One was getting the animals from the farm to the unit, to the, slaughtering place and then the other is cold storage capacity so how yeah. does it all work together in that scenario that's a great question marty and depending on capacity of of a mobile slaughtering truck uh those trucks have coolers and freezers in them so that they can take the carcasses straight to processors now would they be big enough to handle a central service hub maybe you'd need a separate refrigerated truck to be a hauler Conversely, you could make a, a, a more developed service hub that actually had a, a fixed cold storage uh, facility with controlled access that um, could be part of a network of delivery and, and, and drop off uh, type of work. So kind of using the same food hub model, except to move carcasses from the service hubs to the processors um, if there wasn't capacity on the slaughtering units themselves. So that's a great question. And that kind of ties into the, you know, what level of um, what level of development and infrastructure would you want at each of these? Some of them you may be able to get away with, you know, a, a very, let's call it rustic approach where it's just some cattle panels and, and set up storage areas and then a, uh, a staging ground basically to do the slaughter. 
but others, if the demand was high enough, may benefit from something like a fixed cold storage unit. Okay. I see a message in the chat here from yeah. Nicole. Uh, yeah, do you know anything about what's happening in Skagit with slaughter and processing? Yeah, so Nicole, we didn't go that far north with this study. Uh, we, we, we did have to kind of cut it off at a point. Um, and and I think that it's a, I don't want to steal anybody's thunder, but um, we, my hope is that this project shows that this isn't a, well, be careful about this. It's a very complicated problem. There's a lot of layers here, but actually going out and engaging with the folks that are dealing with the problems is possible and they will share information. And if, if you had the right people together, you can get some pretty good information that you can then take forward. So um, I don't want to say that it's it's an easy thing to try to get your head around, but I think that this this study and some of the other work that WSDA has done recently do show that you know there's an interest in the industry to to provide this information, and so I think that's. Um, that's where I would tell you to go if, if you're having these issues and you need to identify it is, um, you know, hold this up to, to folks in your county and say, look, they did this down south. Um, you know, it's not perfect, but it, they have a much clearer picture of possible actions to take now. Um, okay, I, I know Diane's hand went up and we also got one in the chat, so I'm not sure who was first there. Uh, I think it was Diane. So uh, you want to take the floor? Diane, that was really hard to hear you. It was kind of garbled. Why don't you try the chat? Are you able to do that? Let's let's try Marcy's question, and um, hopefully Diane has access to um, ability to chat. Okay, so Marcy, did you identify any options to increase access and capacity of the folks who deal with the waste parts? Okay, so the waste thing is a great question. Um, and, you know, the the folks dealing the most with the waste were very much just give us a place to get rid of it. We don't even care at this point. We just need access. It's going to be expensive, but they were just very, very concerned about losing that access to it. Um, there wasn't really a lot of thought in what to do with it. Now, this didn't get into the report, and that's part of what this conversation can be about, is if, you know, not everything is in this report for various reasons, but um, one of the things that came out was I was talking to a farmer that um, is not, a, is not a, a beef farmer, but he does have animals that need to be processed at a certain point. And um, he was talking about one of the, the folks he works with and how they are literally monetizing all 1,100 pounds of that animal. And our small processors are not able to do that. And so what, what is happening to those waste streams is you have a whole lot of burden being placed just on the marketable meat and not on the hide and not on the meal and not on um, all those other components that the huge processing facilities can capitalize on. Now, they might be getting, you know, pennies on the dollar for, for these, these other co-products, but those co-products are basically paying the utilities. They're paying the bills so that these large processing facilities uh, can, can turn more profit off of the meat itself. So the waste thing is, um, is, a, is a question that was really hard to unpack at this scale because we weren't talking to the types of facilities that have capacity to handle it. They just need to get rid of it. Uh, the, the, the folks down at Puget Sound Processing had a whole issue with waste and uh, disposal with Thurston County Health Department. It got very messy, uh, no pun intended there. Um, and they've had to relocate. Uh, and that's been a, a big hiccup for our local uh, uh, processing infrastructure. So waste is a huge issue. But we're not talking about facilities that are dealing with enough capacity to monetize it in a um, yeah. So that I, I don't have the answer to the waste question, but 
there there has to do with a it's a scale issue really for us locally. There's a related waste question comment from Amber. Waste was more of an issue for slaughters than processors. What is being done or can be done to alleviate this? Do you want to add anything about that? Yeah, the, the main thing that could be done is there just has to be more recognition on behalf of our um, landfills that this is an, a high need issue um, that is is directly impacting our farms. If landfills are going to not take this, are going to put punitively high prices on it, it's going to impact farms. And so that's something that, you know, there has to be some balance between the public and private interests that manage those landfills um, to accept more wastes from uh, processing and slaughtering facilities. Can you hear me now? Yes, Diane. Sorry, I'm on the road and so I've got sketchy reception. Um, this is related to waste you know, sort of tangentially, but I know that in our area we have a um, a local tribe that has a relationship also place and they're a certified compost composter and they compost all of that and so they monetize they've monetized it um, it's only not fish compost and it, it's a great product and so that it, you know those kinds of relationships are a possible option for the waste stream yeah um, there's I, oh sorry anyway, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, well, there's the Washington Organic Recycling Council, and they do um, uh, a compost training, and it's really for commercial uh, composting. And so that that is one pathway. We've had some uh, workshops in Pierce County with WSU uh, helping sponsor some of that, um, and and it works. You know, you can compost these these waste materials even down to the bone. Um, but again, it gets back to that scale and capacity uh, and how do you get to that point? But the technology is definitely there. So I'm glad you brought that up, Diane. Well, and it, animal waste is a high value food stuff for compost because it's high in nitrogen and sometimes nitrogenous waste is something they struggle to get. It's just managing odor that becomes a huge problem, right? Because nobody wants to have a rendering plant or somebody dumping something that's going to smell like dead things, you know, in their backyard. Um, my question has to do with mobile processing. I was part of the Puget Sound Meat Producers Cooperative, and we struggled with um, a number of issues, which is why Heritage ended up, and you know, Puget Sound Processing ended up taking over the mobile unit. Um, but the, one of our big challenges had to do with complying with the necessary requirements for a USDA um, slaughter. You had to have the holding facilities. You had to have, um, you know, all of those kinds of things. So you couldn't just set up a bunch of cattle panels. So I guess I'm wondering why is it that the Island Producers Cooperative has been so successful and folks like the Puget Sound Meat Producers Cooperative like really struggled because we have huge demand in this area and you would have thought that since we had this template, it would have worked, but it didn't. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Diane. Um, you know, I, I wasn't around when all that was going on, um, but I, I do know a little bit of the backstory about it. Um, the fact that they had to leave Pierce County and go to Thurston was somewhat regulation based. Um, and even in Thurston County, they've run into some problems recently. They think they've got it corrected now. Um, but as far as the, the mobile USDA, yeah, it is, uh, it's, it's quite onerous to meet the standard for that mobile unit. Um, and that's one of the things that we don't really go into in this study is, is trying to promote heavily mobile USDA slaughtering because it is a burden um, you need to have a very special and um, and designed and managed waste management process especially for the liquid wastes um, you know the solids are one thing but you have a lot of liquid that has to be dealt with every single day um, and so that's why you know old dairies with uh, <laughs> with ponds have have succeeded in in past instances but um, you know I mean speaking for Pierce County, we don't have a lot of those places left. I can think of maybe two 
that still have uh, a certified um, manure pond uh, that was, you know, met all the USDA requirements when it was constructed. So those are some issues with infrastructure um, when it comes to that USDA mobile slaughter. And, and I don't know enough about the island situation to, to comment on it. Um, okay. Okay, I, I did answer Jake's question in the chat. Um, and then Amber processors utilize all the animal most profit are these products made from the byproducts can, desired by consumers. They're not necessarily desired by consumers, but they're kind of um, intermediates. A lot of these things go into other products. Um, you know, a, a lot of the the kind of <laughs> the ground and the meal and stuff go into other animal feed frequently. Uh, you know, the hides are used in leathering and tanning and stuff like that. And so um, it, it's not exactly consumer product, but... Um, you know, they're those intermediates that do have value, um, but not, but it's difficult to generate the value unless, again, you have the scale to actually separate all those materials and process, pre process them in a way that is acceptable to the buyers of those raw products. So, um, yeah, it, it's. <laughs> It's not an easy thing to answer, and it's kind of like a it's kind of a pass the buck answer, but that's just the nature of it. Um, that's great. Well, thank you so much um, for these great questions and responses. I want to let you all. Uh, we're going to wrap it up now. I want to let you all know that on the um, on our website, which I will put in the in the chat, it's just www.fsp.org. You can go to the resources library and all of the lunch and learns are under there. You can get recordings and these Q and A sheets that we put together afterward. It's your questions and it's a lot of resources as well that are, um, you know, in addition to what has been presented or it's resources that were referenced and we'll put those in the Q&A sheets. I know if you attended last um, the last Lunch and Learn that Mike Peroni did on cooperative development, and you go to the website now, you will see a big list of resources right at the top of the Q&A sheet. It was really valuable. So use that website. Feel free to forward those Lunch and Learns to people who you think would be interested. Also, please, fill out an evaluation after each of these. That's what we need to kind of keep being able to produce them. And it's a very short evaluation. Emily just put the link in the chat for you. And um, we would really appreciate that after each one. Um, next Lunch and Learn that we will be scheduled, uh, that is scheduled, is for September 27th. It's Melissa Moeller speaking about value-added producer grants and um, strategies for getting those. She's a whiz at getting them. And so it has lots of great tips for people who are interested in, in trying to go for one of those grants. So we hope to see you on September 27th. Thank you again, Mike Poteet, for this presentation. Really, really great stuff. And I think that's it. Yeah, thanks everyone.